Well, we're so glad that you're here. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, pre Columbian mathematics. And uh, pre Columbian mathematics means before Christopher Columbus came to the Americas, um, there was uh, a time before that. So what we're talking about, or the people that we're talking about, are people who lived on this continent before um, the time of Christopher Columbus. And the reason that we're going to go through this is because um, there's a lot of history about mathematics that the people before Christopher Columbus knew and understood. And we think it's important for um, our youth to understand that their ancestors, people from many, many years ago, had a lot of wonderful understanding both about mathematics and about science. And basically, they are your ancestors. And so therefore, these people leave to you a great um, capacity. Because if they could do it, you could do it. Because we know in science that um, every cell in our body carries genetic memory. So you have dormant memory about math that you may not know about, but if you become interested in it, it's something that you can take and move forward. So we don't want to always stay with the ancient, we want to move forward, that's part of evolution. But it's important to understand math and science the way it was understood many years ago because they leave us a great history. So what we're going to be looking at is um, the Mayans. And the Mayans had a theory about the beginning of the universe. And they understood that the universe was created from nothing. And in the 1920s, which is modern day, we have people that tell us that um, the energy uh, of, of a single unit um, created the Big Bang. And the Big Bang means that then uh, creation continued to expand. And scientifically, that is something that scientists look at and document and understand in a scientific world about the expansion of the universe, which continues to expand in the, that's modern day science, but in the ancient science, the Mayans talked about Se, which was the original unit, and it was the essence of the origin, or the, that which started everything. And then Ome is a word that referred to the essence of duality or balance. And then Ye was the sacred liquid that unified, and Nawi was the complete body. And they understood geometry in a very special way. In this picture, you see that they understood, you know, they had two hands and they had two feet. And if you connect them, you made a, um, a quadratic figure by connecting the dots. They also understood that, um, that there was more than one as things continued to expand. So they uh, created a numbering system. And we know about their numbering system because they wrote on the cave walls, just like you've read in other stories. And actually, the Mayans are the first, um, uh, the first people that we know of historically that created the concept of zero. The concept of zero is very, very important because you really can't have a numbering system unless you understand zero. And they use things around them to document numbers. And so that zero that you see up there looks like a, a nut or an acorn. And that was what they would use when they were marking their numbers. So the acorn represented a zero. And then they had their fingers, and so they would look at the tip of their fingers and call one tip a one, and two of them would be a two, and so forth, um, until you got to four. And then after four, 
they connected all four dots and they came up with one line, which was the five. And then six was one line with one more dot and so forth. And then two fives would be two lines, which would be 10. And then they continued to add um, dots to the lines. And they actually had a place value system. In, in, uh, in our modern world, we know of our place value system as the ones place, the tens place, and so forth. Well, they created a system that was uh, a base 20 system. And they showed their, um, their place value by showing the bottom as the uh, ones place and the top being the 20s place. So you had one 20 indicated by that number on the bottom left hand of the screen. They created this uh, instrument, and you've got one in front of you, that's like an abacus. And this abacus is referred to as the Nepo Watsitsi. And the Nepo Watsitsi was created with um, 13 rows, and they had seven beads in each row. And if you multiply 13 by 7, you have a total of 91 beads. This number was very basic to the uh, Mayan culture. They understood that it was something that had a, a gave them a very close connection between exact amounts and the natural phenomenon. Um, 91 to them represented the number of days that a, a season lasts. And uh, 2 times 91, or 2 seasons, was now the day, the number of days that it took for the corn to grow. And everything that the Mayans did and understood with their numbers uh, was very interconnected. Their spiritual life was connected with their numbers and their planting and so forth. So two cycles of 91 then became uh, the time of the corn from sowing to harvest. And then three nowes or three times 91 was 273, and that's the number of day days that it takes for a baby for the gestation period. And then 4 times 91 is a complete cycle for one year, um, which is 364. So this Nepowatsitsin was a calculation instrument, and um, it's derived from their language um, by putting together little words. And ne referred to the person, and Fowal referred to uh, la cuenta en español, or to count, or accounting. And then um, uh, tzitzin was to transcend uh, that which took small elements and made it uh, to the next level. And this information, if you wanted to study more about it, comes from Everardo Lara Gonzalez's book. And uh, you can check more about that in the, um, on the internet, I'm sure. And then um, they also had a, uh, a document, one of the oldest documents uh, uh, from this culture, the Popol Vuh, is um, where they collected their history, they documented their history, and they documented the history of what they believed the history of humanity was. And in this document, uh, we can read that they understood that the cosmos was created and distributed in two quadratic planes. And so we have a picture there of the two quadratic planes. And basically, they took the lines and understood that if you connected the lines, um, you have a quadratic shape. So their understanding of the universe was that you had um, the top plane and the lower plane and then the plane in between. So for them, the top plane was the heavens and um, the bottom plane was below the earth and in between was where people lived. And so they understood that, that their life was like a journey to ascend to that upper plane, which is the, the heavenly plane. And in many religions today, we still see ourselves as on a journey towards the heavenly plane. Um, they were very able with their numbers. They, everything that they did uh, was connected to this numbering system that they created. And so here you can see um, a picture of a pyramid. 
And if you look at pyramids and you study them, you see that um, 91 stairs was very important in the pyramids that they built because 91, as I went through just a minute ago, was a very important number to them because uh, each phase of 91 meant something. So they created their pyramids using the number of 91. And then we have a picture there of an arm and the instrument that you have in front of you, the the Nepawatsitsin, they actually had like a bracelet that they wore on their arm because the people who were the accountants, they could go around and use the Nepawatsitsin on their arm to do the accounting of the crops or anything else that they were doing, such as building pyramids. If you look at the numbers um, at the bottom of the screen, if you added 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, so on, up to the number 13, you see that that is represented by 91. So when you study the uh, pyramids, the numbers 13 and 91 continue to repeat themselves. 13 also represented the interior growth of human beings. And then they talk about the harmony between the heaven and the earth. So in their dimensional design, they talked about the different levels, and they had different gods for different levels. And they understood those points to also correspond to their individual bodies. Today, in different cultures, we have people that talk about the chakras. Different cultures talk about uh, the energy spots in the body. Uh, Chinese do. Uh, Qi uh, for releasing energy in the body. Well, in the Mayans, uh, they also had the 13 sacred spots within the human body. They had four stages of human development. Um, they understood the first 13 years to be the childhood phase. Then from ages 13 to 52, they considered that the active phase for the humans. And then from 52 to 91, it was more of a creative life for them. And then the final stage of life was 91 to 104. Those two planes of reality that we talked about earlier, the heavenly and the earthly, they saw as um, going uh, from childhood to the final stage. But they felt that while they were on Earth, um, you know, human beings were on both a mental and a spiritual journey. And when we're on Earth, we begin with the nine-month gestation, which uh, corresponds to the nine heaven on Earth levels, which we just saw. And then as human beings on this earthly plane, we ascend those nine spiritual levels um, while we contain within our human body the 13 points that we just saw in that other picture. Um, because we are on this journey, the Mayans felt, um, it, it meant that we had great responsibility to one another. And um, there, these societies were structured in a way that they constructed a didactic or an educational system, which resulted in an outstanding social and political organization amongst them. And the men and women of their culture respected um, the equilibrium of the universe and nature, and they maintained a solid social ideal. And what we mean by this is that their education transformed itself because they passed on from within that society to each other. They were very cooperative, and everybody had a role. And if you were a philosopher, then that meant that you became a teacher of philosophy to a certain set of people, those that were going into philosophy. If you were a scientist, then you were going to teach others in your culture to become scientists and soldiers or teachers of art. Whatever the profession was, there were, they became like um, units that would teach the young the same, um, the same skills and the same arts. So they, uh, if you look at their writings and you look at their society, they understood the, some very fundamental things and they made sure that their societies went by these things. So they had a very good understanding of the heavens and the astros. 
their numbering system, although I just showed the very basic one in a few minutes, we're going to have the young men show you how large their numbering system got, and you'll get to play a little bit with the Nepoatsitsi. Um, these numbers that were so huge were their way of understanding numbers of years that went by and the different phases of the universe and how far astral bodies were from each other. So they had a very good understanding of uh, what we today would call space. Um, they had, uh, because they needed to know these big numbers, they had a very uh, good study system for accounting and understanding their numbers. Um, but they also paid attention to other things like the art of speaking with elegance, the science of governance, the understanding of genealogy, um, science, the accounting of mathematics, theology and liturgy because they put everything together, nothing was separate. The knowledge of understanding your history, the painting, and there were people that were very dedicated to to the, the glyphs, and that's why we know so much about Mayans, because they, they uh, wrote and painted with their pictures uh, along um, cave walls and um, the, the huge um, uh, pyramids that they built. So they tell us their story because there were people that were very gifted at creating those glyphs. So um, they did theater, song, dance, and of course we've talked about architecture. I started off by talking a little bit about genetic memory, and we, we do have evidence in science about every cell within our body being like um, the, the microbe. Just like we have a brain as a, as a full human body, every cell in our body actually has a brain. And so these cells that parents pass on to us are passing on a rich genetic memory. And so the modern day um, descendants of the Mayans are very dedicated to making sure that we pass this understanding of um, our ancestry and how good they were with science and math and all the other things I just mentioned because they feel like when young people, such as the ones that are here today, uh, understand this math and start doing it, that you're like waking up a rich genetic memory that that can be passed on. And so often our kids in school today um, don't, don't understand that they have this wonderful uh, background, you know, within their own families. It may be uh, many generations back, but it's a rich background. And we want to elevate that and make kids feel like, I had ancestors that knew great things that they did without computers. So I am capable of being very good at math or very good at science. And so our purpose is to share this with you today so that kids can feel like they can enter a STEM field. They can become the, um, the people who are creating um, the next generation of the abacus, um, the computers, the apps that people can put onto these small computers that we call phones. Um, and, and we don't know what will be created tomorrow because it's the young people today, if they are given this understanding and we motivate you to know that your ancestors had great ability, therefore you carry it within you and it's your turn. And that's <clears throat> basically the message that I would like to give to you today. And I'd like to pass this on now to my colleagues because um, I'm, I'm in that 50s plus um, level, but, but there's an in-between level. And I want you to meet them because I want you to see yourself in them because they're doing exactly what I talked about a minute ago. They are evidence that they carry that genetic memory and they're doing something with it. And that's what we'd like for you to see yourself in, in, in these young men. So these games that are in front of you that uh, Ms. Maria Mena explained to you, the Nepo, and then we're going to talk a little bit later about the Pitara. These games, of course, were physical objects. You know, this is what we use. These are actually the game boards. And what we've done is we've taken these games and we've created online versions of them. And the young men that are standing here before me are computer science majors here at UTSA who had to learn first how to play the game 
And then they were able to take code and create it online. And that's why the computer's in front of you, because we're going to play those in just a second. So I want to introduce the folks who have made this possible, these students. Um, first, we have Priya Pramesi. And he is 23 years old, and he graduated from James Taylor High School in Katy, Texas. He's an international student from Indonesia who is currently majoring in psychology and computer science. He's been in the United States for eight years, and his main interest is artificial intelligence, and specifically a branch of artificial intelligence called machine learning. He plans to be a data scientist whose job is to go through large amounts of data and extract patterns from it. His favorite subject in high school was economics and mathematics. Priya, just wait. Hello. And our next student is Matthew Anthony Gamble, and he's 23 year old. 23-year-old computer science major here at UTSA. He graduated from Steele High School in 2007, the very first graduating class from Steele High School. Um, his favorite subjects in high school were history, culinary, arts, and any computer-related classes like web design and multimedia. His main focus as a computer science major is software engineering, um, so he can become a web developer. Uh, he plans on a career in the video game industry as a programmer. A little more information about him is that he is half African American and half Korean. Um, he's a military child and has traveled around the world and, had, and he's the last of three siblings. And then, Matt, wait. Oh. <laughs> and our last student is um, Rudolf Carvel Scott III. He goes by Carvel though. Um, he's a senior computer science major at UTSA, and he, he helped develop the Nepal Watsitsi, which is this game right here. And he's working on, he worked on the click de detection, sound effects, and automated design of most of the beat sets. He first started programming in BASIC on a TI-83 in middle school, writing various programs to calculate damage and stats in Pokemon games <laughs> at first, then moving on to small text-based adventure games. As he got older, he learned to make 2D action games in Game Maker software using GML. As of today, he's currently programming a Flash game using ActionScript 3, but thanks to UTSA, learned to program games in Java and C and numerous other languages. Not just games, but databases, web, web pages, software automation, scripts, and still increasing list of others. As a computer science major, he's studying to become a software engineer, hoping to one day make a game that inspires another kid to find the math hidden behind it and take up programming as well. So, very nice. Um, so each of them has, has had a part in the game and making the game. And in a minute, we're going to actually play the, the hard versions of these before we play the electronic versions. And when we play the electronic versions, each of them are going to tell you a little bit about what it took to create that, OK? Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to repeat again that you know I'm talking about history. Um, but the reason I want to do the history is because I want, um, especially the youth here and parents, you know, your role is to seek schools that can maybe um, help your kids continue with this interest. And, um, and if your schools need a place to uh, maybe refer um, to someone who knows about this, UTSA would be a place because UTSA works with schools. So up here, I'm uh, showing you uh, in a base 10 system, how the NEPO could be used. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the Mayan numbering system, and the Mayans had a base 20 system, but we don't do base 20 anymore. We do base 10. And so I'm going to show you how this instrument was used for calculating, but I'm going to use the base, uh, the base 10 system because that's what, what you would understand a little bit more. So on this very um, far, um, my right, your right, thank you. If you could just kind of like hold it, that would be great. Um, so here we have the ones, uh, I'm sorry, the ones place, the tens place, and the one hundreds, and that would be on the bottom under the bar. And up at the top, we have fives and fifties and five hundreds. 
Then it goes on 2,000, 10,000, 100,000, and up here would be the 5,000, the 50,000, and the 500,000. And so it just goes up to very huge numbers, as you can see. But what I'm going to have you do is get your little instrument and you can look at it so that the, the single line is on your left. And then we're going to use it to count. Okay, everybody ready? So the way this was used for counting, if you put uh, one one up, you've just marked one. If you put another one up, you have two. Then you put another one up, you have three. And then another one would be four. When you've done that, you have no more ones, so you convert it into one five and close your one. And then you would go from 5 to 5 plus 1 is 6. And then 5 plus 2 is 7. And 5 plus 3 is 8. And 5 plus 4 is 9. So I don't have any more 1s. I've got a 5 and a 4, 9. What comes after 5 plus 4, 9? What comes next? 10. So how would I represent a 10 on this nickel? Who has figured that out? You can do two fives. That's a good answer. What else can you do? Five, six. He's the next one over. Yeah, the one ten. So you would convert these two fives into a one ten. Does that make sense? Would you all like to do that, just that part one more time? So you get a little bit better idea? Let's do that one more time together. So we'll <coughs> count together. Ready? One, one. And two. And three. And four. And to create a five, I go up here and get one five and close my ones. Okay? So now we've got five plus one is six. six. 5 plus 2 is 7, 5 plus 3 is 8, 5 plus 4 is 9. So now we can convert that and make it a 10, but we've got two 5s, so we've got a 10's place, so we convert those two 5s into one 10. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to take it a little bit further, and let's say that we have the number 10. And I wanted to add something. Let's say I was adding ears of corn. And so somebody has 10 ears of corn, and then the Mayan wants to buy, let's say, 13 more. So we already have 10 Mayan corns, and we're going to add 13. So how would I do that? I would show 110 and 11, 12, 13. Right? So how many total do I have now? 10, 20, 1, 2, 3. I have 23. Right? So now, let's do another addition problem. Somebody give me a number. 55? Okay. So let's look at our 50s places up at the top, in the middle. So we would flip 150 up. And then we want to show 55, so we need a 5. So we have 55. Now, what can we add to 55? Somebody else give me a number. 10. If we want to look for our 10th place, it's here. So now we have 55 plus 10, we would say, uh, 55 plus 10 is 65. Right? So it would be 50, 60, 5. Okay? This is fun? Okay. Well, let's do another one. If it's fun, let's do another one, okay? All right. I'll let you give me a number since you like it. Give me a number. 
15. 15. Okay, so how are we going to show 15? We're going to get 1, 1 what? 1 and 10. And what else do we need to make a 15? 1, 5. Oh, one, five. So that would be 15. So let's get another number. Who wants to give me a number? Can you give me a number? You give me a number. Any number. Uh, 27. 27. That's a good number. Okay. So we would show 27 by doing 10, 20, 5, 26, 27. So now we look at our numbers. And I don't even remember what the first one was, but I know we have 10, 20. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, we have 10, 20, 30, and then we have um, two fives. So what do I have to do with this five? These two fives. Ten. Make a ten. So we have 10, 20, 30, 40, two. Does that make sense? Okay. So that is how you play with the ancient Nepawatsitse. And so um, I'm going to let you play with the ancient Nepawatsitse by yourself for a few minutes. You can refer to this screen. And while you're doing that, we're going to get ready to, sh to open up the computers so that you can then, after you play with this one, you can play with the one that these young men have created. And that's what we want you to remember, that just like they did, they helped evolution. They took the very ancient and they made something very modern. And that's pretty much what life is all about. And so we're expecting that of all these young people. So play with your nipple and we'll go and get the computers ready. When we were told to uh, develop the nipple watch chain, we were told to uh, go with the phase 20 system that they use instead of the traditional phase 10. Oh, I'm uh, we were told to go with the phase 20 system instead of the phase 10 that we all know and love. Uh, phase 10 is basically 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Well, phase 20, well, that goes to 20, but they represent it with different digits. Now, let's see if I can. Okay, I not quite like this at the bottom of the program. Um, but I implemented it a bit. And then it'll work. Okay. You can start to see the little, uh, the uh, digit over here is on a show. As she told, that's there with one, two, three, four, and then. Uh, after we try add, adding one to four, uh, we start going to four to five. Um, now, unfortunately, I can't really access the bottom of the program to show you what uh, just an ordinary one looks like. Uh, the screen's kind of too small here. Um, um, but if you take a look at your physical, uh, at your nipple watch on the table, like the uh, physical ones, and so hold it up like you have, uh, like it's positioned right there. The very bottom is going, to, the very bottom row is going to represent your ones. The next row up will represent your twenties. Now, so adding and subtracting is bit different uh, when, uh, uh, when working with the, uh, when, work, when working with base twenties, because. No, um, numbers need to go a lot high. How big are these? Uh, how big you have? All right. Um, let's see if I can get it uh, working more correctly on here. Okay. Now, if you see this little display at the bottom, that's how big those numbers go. Can you guess what the number is? <laughs> All right, I'll say it for you. It is 8,191 quintillion, 999 quadrillion, 999 trillion, 999 billion, 999 999,999. That's 
with um, a prepaid number. Uh, no. um, to put it into perspective, a million Earths can fit into the sun, but it can turn to how big it is. Um, and a quintillion, I'm really not sure how to pronounce it actually. I think that's about one million times the size of uh, a trillion? No, no actually, uh, one, it's, it's one billion times the size of a trillion, I believe. Um, but yes, it does go up very high, and it just goes to show you that the minds have a very deep connection with the universe. And they needed these, uh, they needed to have numbers to be able to calculate all the things that they did. So, the base 20 system, although it might be a bit complex for us to wrap our heads around, it's, um, it was quite necessary back then. Uh, but now, we have computers to handle these things, so it's not that, it's not too big. Too big. And, um, any questions? So we're going to have you practice um, the worksheet. a pencil and a worksheet that looks like this. <coughs> no. No. So I want you to get your pencil and inside of on number one you see blank plus blank equals. So I want you to put a number four in the first blank and then I want you to put a number two in the second blank. Okay. Got it? All right. So now I want you to use your old-fashioned nipple okay. to add one, two, three, four, plus two. We have no more ones, right? So we go from here to here, and then one more. So we have four plus two is six. So now you write your answer in the square. Okay? So now I'm going to give you some more problems, and then I'm going to let you work on them alone. Okay? On number two, in the first blank, I want you to write the number 11. Second blank, I want you to write um, the number 1. And uh, I'm sorry, that should have been a number 5. and then a zero. On number three, we're gonna get a little bit tougher. I want you to write 100 on the first blank. I want you to write 50 on the second blank. And then one on the next blank and zero. <laughs> on the last one. Uh, so number three is 100 plus 50 plus one plus zero. Okay, number four, I want you to do 70 plus 66 plus 15 
plus 10. Plus 4. All right. So we're going to stop right there on number 4. Okay. And I want you to use the nipple and when you get to the end of number one, we put the answer inside of that square. Now I want you to do the math with the nipple, add number two, and put your answer in that square at the end. And then you do the same thing for number three and number four. And then at the end, you're going to take the answers from all your squares and you're going to put them on number five. And then you come up with an answer. Okay, we'll check the math. Four plus two, what answer did you get? Six. Six is correct. And 11 plus five plus zero? 16. 16 is correct. Then we had 100 plus 50 plus one? 151. And then we did 70 plus 66 plus 15 plus 10 plus four? 165. And you notice, like when you were doing the nepo, you had to convert those fives to tens, and, and, and uh, when you got to the hundreds, you had to move over. So then we added six plus 16 plus 151 plus 165, and what did you all come up with? 338. Very good, 338. And then, if you were playing this with an opponent, um, the little points earned over to the side, if you got your answer right, you would put, you know, one point for getting the answer, two points, and you could earn up to five points. And then you would add five to your subtotal, and you'd come up with another new grand total. So was that fun? Yeah! Yeah. <laughs> I like that enthusiasm. So, um, we did simple math today, but this instrument, and we're not going to uh, go into that today, but this instrument, you saw how huge the numbers were that um, Carvel showed to us, right? And if you're talking about space and huge distances, like light years, you would need numbers as big as this. So the Mayans had a very, uh, very good understanding when their numbering system started with fingertips and one line meaning five and, and so forth. Um, this instrument can actually do multiplication, division, subtraction, and square roots as well. So if you're interested in finding out more, there's a lot of information on the internet. And again, if you want to talk to teachers in your school, the Academy for Teacher Excellence also sponsors after school clubs at schools who are interested in learning history and math. We, we sponsor uh, pre columbian math clubs at schools. So that's just a piece of information in case you want to pass that on to um, your children's schools. Um, we're going to talk now about another game. The next game is called La Pitarra. And this game was a game of mental dexterity. And back in my earlier part of the presentation where it was uh, got a little historical and some of you were like mm, not real, real interested. Well, here I want to show you that everything the Mayans did was interconnected. And we talked about the different planes and they had the heavenly plane, the in-between plane, and the um, lower plane. And so if you look at this game board, it actually is, um, if you think of it geometrically, it's actually the three different planes. And so uh, everything that they did was about connecting everything in life, their history, their spirituality, their numbering system. And here's a good example of one where that was done. The pitarra is um, a, what they refer to as a cosmic cross. And in the scheme, you could see the three representative squares that I talked to you about. And for them, it signified the Earth, the cosmos, and what was in between. 
And again, it's about the human beings and the purpose of the game is for you to get um, three, um, a trilogy or three um, chips in a row. And we'll go a little bit deeper into that in just a minute. But again, it represented um, things about heaven and earth, the duality that they understood. And here today we have uh, red and white chips, but in the uh, Mayan game they use black and white because it was all about opposites. And when, like the yin and the yang that you see, it's usually the black and the white. This is very similar to that. Them um, uh, depicting the duality of, lo of life and the opposites and the balance. So in this game, you're going to try to um, get the trilogy, which again represents those three levels of life. And you can get those three anywhere on the, the board. And we're just like we did with the nipple, we're going to do the same thing with the pitara. And I'm going to show you on the actual board that you have in front of you, you have points just like everything that we talked about earlier in terms of numbers. When there's an intersection, it's a point. So there's one point, two points, three points, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So everywhere that the lines intersect are points. So when we start to play the game, you will take turns. And if I'm playing against this lady, I'll put mine here. And then she'll choose her color and she'll put it on any one of those points. And the point is for um, me to get three in a row, either one, two, three here, or one, two, three here, vertically, horizontally, any which way. So she, her point is always to block me from making a three. And my point is to block her from being able to make a three. So we're gonna play that, and then we're gonna show you Again, that these young men have been able to create an online version for us to play with as well. So the point is for you to keep blocking each other because um, the player who gets, if I, if, uh, I forgot to explain one thing. If I get three in a row, If I did this and she missed blocking me, well then I get to get one of her colored pieces. So now she has one less piece than me. And you keep doing that. And any time that I get three in a row, I take away one of her colored dots, okay? Got it? Okay, we're gonna talk about the online version next. As you can tell, uh, we created this guitar uh, game and we me, Priya, and three other uh, computer science majors, uh, we uh, developed this. The other three guys couldn't make it, but we are here to show you what we did. And we did this over our advanced software engineering class over this past summer. And it took us about two and a half months to uh, complete the entire full functioning game, as you see right here. And uh, we used a language called Java and uh, a program called Eclipse to create this game. And uh, Priya will now tell you about the development of um, Basically, we developed this in uh, four different cycles, or uh, we call it sprints. Uh, in the first sprint, we uh, basically just created the, uh, the board first. And in the second sprint, we developed the logic and how we put it and the rules of the game and whatnot. And in the third uh, sprint, we actually put the, the, the words and the letters and whatnot and the uh, images also. And also, there should be a, a song that's playing, but for some reason it's not playing, and the sound, can, can, and what, um, try to play it. Uh, yeah. Keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> okay. And um, in the fourth sprint, we basically just tested it and see if it's working fine, see if there's bugs in there, and uh, you know, finalize everything and make it work. Uh, okay. And um, yeah. Actually, uh, I am the scrum master, basically the the, pro, uh, the team manager. I, I help what to do basically, and uh, he developed the. Uh, the images, and he also code, and also code too, and um, yeah, that's about it. And um, now he's gonna show you how to play the game. And while we're waiting for the computer to catch uh, yeah, up, sure. yeah. 
there's some people that walked in a little bit late, and I just want to reiterate something we said earlier. Hi. And what we want is for the young people that joined us today to see themselves in these young men. They were, it was not too long ago that they were in high school, and, um, and here they are already creating things on computers, that, and their aspirations were to uh, become computer scientists, and that's what they're doing. And they're not through with their degrees yet, and so we hope that the young people here will begin to think about the fact that you can enter a STEM career, be it math, science, whatever technology. We invite you to think of yourselves as these young men. So, um, that's basically how, yes, you want to learn all the changes? Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, it's basically the same as the, the board game and um, young play. Sure. The basic game we had originally, well, that I just changed to was a simple, if you get three in a row, the game finishes. And I'll show it to you real quick. Say, uh, player one, player core, and then just put that there. Win. That was the basic game we created, and then we actually cre created the traditional game, which you guys have been playing. When you put, uh, you're placing down all 12 pieces and then shuffling them as you go along. And we also implemented here on the side right here. You can enter your name, say my name, and that will keep track of how, who, how many times you win and whatnot. And we'll put Joe and player one. They'll go back and forth, just like have you been playing. So, uh, just for the sake of the game, I'll show you. I got three in a row. And of course, it highlights them which one you can take, and you get to take Joe's piece away. And Joe, in turn, goes back to his turn. And you keep playing back and forth. Let me try and get it to the point where you start shuff uh, shuffling. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, yes. You got it. The computers are up there. Go ahead. 